All right, so this is going to be the end of our unit for unit two on the lithosphere. So remember, we started off with the Earth's layers. Then we understood plate tectonics of how the world started off as Pangaea, and then we broke it down by the movement of plates because of the convection currents inside the crust and in the mantle. Then we talked about rocks, about how there was different types of rocks in the right cycles and how some rocks was formed. So we have igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary, but we also talked about how some of those rocks came from magma and lava. So we talked about the earthquakes, and we also talk about volcanoes. Now we're going to end it up by recalling soil and the weathering of rocks that we talked about, as well as we want to unexplain um, the difference between um, chemical and physical weathering. But we also want to look at the different varieties. So things that can happen by erosion of water, wind, ice, and gravity on various landforms. So weathering soil and mass movement. So what is weathering? Well, weathering is the breaking down and changing of rocks near the Earth's surface. Okay, so this is what it started off as, and all of a sudden it's cracked and kind of different. And there's two types, mechanical, which is physical, and chemical weathering. Well, mechanical weathering, remember, this is physical forces. Um, break down rock into smaller and smaller pieces without the rocks changing the mineral composition. So basically, if you got a rock and you broke it, it never changed what the rock is made of, right? So it just breaks down over time. If you look, um, there's different things. It has unloading. We have frost action that causes rock to crack and water and stuff will get inside. Roots, we see this all the time where plants and weeds go through cement and go through rocks. Uh, temperature change. If, if something's too hot, it can possibly crack. If something's too cold, it can crack. So here's the three main. We're going to talk about frost wedging, unloading, and biological activity. So look at this rock, how it is split. Look at how this is all cracked down. Look at how a tree grew out of here. Look at how water formed in between. So frost wedging, all rocks have openings in them. The openings may be poor spaces between grains, right? So little poor spaces. Um, sometimes it's of uh, fractures, as you see here. Some of the openings will extend to the surface of the rock. So sometimes you're able to see the crack in the rock from the outside. But what happens is expansion of freezing water in cracks and crevices. So eventually, if you do have water that gets inside of here and it freezes, we understand water expands when it's frozen. So eventually it will break the rocks into smaller pieces or make the cracks worse. Sections of the rocks that are wedged loose are called talus. So as you see here, you see how there's a break inside of it? Well, once the water got in the crack, it expanded and then the water dried up and it left a wedge and those wedges called talus. Now we have unloading. If you look at this, this kind of looks really crazy. It looks like little steps and just rocks everywhere. Well, this is the uplift and erosion of rocks of overlying igneous rocks because of the pressure on the igneous rocks. This is exfoliation. Exfoliation is the slabs of other rocks separate and break loose. So as you see, when igneous rock is uplifted, erosion is taking place. So expansion of the uplifted rock happens. And so as it expands, sometimes you ever seen something stretch, it started getting a little bumpy, pulled out a little bit. And that's what happens with the exfoliation. We also have biological activity. Now, this is just real things. Uh, plants, trees is growing out of the rocks. Look at the roots. Look at how this tree, this is a real picture, by the way, of a tree and it's growing through like the house and the rocks that was built out of burying animals and humans. Because what we do, we build, take the rocks out, right? We hit the rocks. We try to make stuff, build houses. Plant re uh, roots wedge through cracks and breaks them apart. So if the plant roots find anywhere they can grow. So if it can get in a crack, it's going to do just that. 
So what is chemical weathering? Well, chemical weathering is transformation of rock into one or more new compounds. So let's look at here. These are different colors, right? Can you think that was that original color? Well, what about this? Okay, can you see it all in here? Different colors? Well, once the color changed, the chemical compound changes as well. So let's look at the Statue of Liberty. Do you think it was always green? No. It used to be copper. Chemical weathering changed it to be green, and it's reading a different chemical um, material. So agents and evidence of chemical weathering. Water. Water is the most important agent of chemical and mechanical weathering. What is the most important agent? Water is the most important agent of chemical and mechanical weathering. And it picks up CO2 and SO2 in the air, which forms acid rain. Granted, weathering of potassium produces clay minerals, cellular salt, silica, and quartz remains unaltered. So there is a change. That's evidence. That was an evidence. Okay, this is the agent. This was an evidence. So again, you see this? This is what the Statue of Liberty looks like. See the color change? You see the composition change? Well, this is how it started off. So silicate materials and spidorial weathering. So weathering of silicate uh, materials produces insoluble iron oxides and clay minerals. Okay. Now also we have, that is again the silicate. And that's uh, your idea. Now here, spidorial weathering causes corners of edges of rocks to be more rounded. So this rock eventually was like this. Now it's like this. So something is changing this chemically to make this go into a circle more than a sharp edge. Now, what is the rate of weathering? Well, how fast rocks erode? There are two factors. We have the rock characteristics and we have climate. Rock characteristics has to do with the minerals. We already talked about those before how the mineral properties so every rock has different minerals that are inside of it and so that allows its change in the factors uh, about how it erodes the climate temperature and moisture think about it we talk about frost wedging we talk about if there's a lot of rain it can change the chemical thing because it can come back as acid rain and the chemicals change um, high temperatures and abundant moisture something's in a lot of moisture is going to change you can get mold and all the things that grow on it so now we're going to talk about soil. We have to understand the layers of soil. So the top part of soil is the organic layer, which is what we see. Top soil is the first layer that you would end up planting your roots in. So if you do flowers, subsoil is next. Parent material has what? You start seeing rocks. But bedrock is the whole bed of rocks. So soil is a part that regardless that supports the growth of plants. If you don't have soil, your plants are not going to grow. Regolith is the layer of rocks and mineral fragments that covers most of the Earth's land surface. So that's again, when you see the mineral and the little rocks on the top, the regolith is the area you see. Um, and it supports the plants. So there's a lot of sometimes small rocks inside this area, but it does support the plants. So it kind of keeps them stable, helps keep down the levels of erosion, but it's, that's what covers most of the land surface. Now, how is soil being formed? Soil is formed by rock being weathered. So once the weathering happens and a rock breaks into little pieces and breaks into more sediments, it becomes your soil. So again, parent material. Residual, uh, residual soil is parent material weathered from bedrock. Okay, as you can see here, I tried to make sure you could see uh, it in pictures. Transported soil, parent material has been carried elsewhere. So the material flow down here came from here and you see it's a, a mixture, right? So it's not, it can be carried by wind because if you're walking outside, sometimes sand hits you in your eye, but you really don't know where that sand came from. It probably traveled from the beach and took a long time to get here. So the characteristics of soil, soil composition. Soil has four main components. We have mineral matter, okay, that's 45%. Humus, 
right here, which is a part of dead organism. So let's say bugs died or animal died. Humus is a decay remains of the organism. Water is 25% and air is about 25%. So we have the characteristics of soil. So the characteristics of soil is going to help us also understand the soil's texture. The texture refers to the portion of different particle sizes. So one of the first one is sand is large, sand, okay? Silt feels like flour, just kind of soft. There you go. Clay is a little bit smaller, but it can get hard. It's not something, it's kind of sometimes gonna be liquidy, muddy, but it can also harden. Now the mixture of all of them, which is the best for plant life, is you want loam. And loam is this, where it's a mixture of all of it. Now we have to understand the characteristics of soil. So if I was trying to tell you, well, how can we get a loam percentage? Or how would I know if I have loam? Well, you want to, here is a thing. We're going to try to find it. So 60%, you have to know how to read this too for your final exam. So 60% clay. Forty percent silt, let me change my clay, I need to put it to 20, because clay reads left, right, so 40 silt and 40 sand. Well, and these numbers meet, so 20 right here is clay, okay? As you see, it's red. 40 silt, which is green. And 40 sand. Right here, this is where they all touch. What type of soil do I have? I have loam. So again, you have clay, is, as you see, is horizontal lines, a silt, is diagonal and so is sand diagonal. So characteristics of the soil, we also have soil structures. So soil particles lump together to give us a structure. So sometimes we have just crumb, we have platy, uh, we have blocky. So here is like a picture of some of it as well. So we also have to understand how these things change over time. Well time, climate, organisms and slope. Time is important for all geological processes because the longer soil has been former, the thicker it becomes. So over time, soil gets thick, okay? Over time, soil gets thick. Climate has the greatest effect of soil, okay? Organisms furnish the organic matter of soil. However, slopes have poor soils. So the thicker your soil is, is because it's been there for a long time. Climate has the biggest effect on soil formation. What makes a soil better? If we have some organic matter. What is bad? Soil layers. So you have to understand the layers. So the first layer we have is zero horizon, which is your hummus, which is again the decayed areas. Your top soil is horizon A. E horizon is your alluviation layer, okay? Your subsoil is the B horizon. Your C soil, your C horizon is a regolith. Your bedrock is the R horizon. This is your soil profile. So how does water erode the soil? Well, rain uses gravity to move soil, okay? So if you were somebody who pressure washed and you had water, always hitting that same spot it's going to disperse the dirt into another area as well as clean up uh, but it also causes erosion because i'm hitting against something and i'm making it do it uh, so if you keep spraying and spraying too much if it's hard hard spray it can take off paint it can chip flash flooding causes runoff so the more if you have a flood all that stuff so let's just say i had a flood my water was here right Everything that was here is now can be over here because a flood covers it all up and it spreads. Um, strong winds. If you got wind, 
wind is going to move water, and then when you walk in, wind can be blowing particles everywhere. So the processes of water erosion, we have sheet erosion, rills, gullies, and uh, transport sediments. So sheet erosion, we have rills, which is tiny streams. We have gullies, which you see like right here, we have a trench. And we have transport sediments for uh, deposits. So again, we have sheet erosion. We have the little tiny streams, and we can transport it just with the regular river and stuff, the movement of water. So how can we control it? Well, how about we can plant trees called windbreaks? So if you notice, if you've ever seen like a farm and it looked like this, the reason why they have that is so that the erosion of this land won't keep going here and here and here and here and blowing everywhere. It kind of stays in the same area. Uh, terrestrial hillsides. Well, if you notice, like even when you go on a bridge and you see like a bridge, right? Usually on the bridge, there's a hill. And on those hills, you see little flowers all the time. Well, those flowers are there to stop erosion. So if we plow along the contour of hills, you see how there's gaps in between the rows and we kind of go with the flow there or rotating crops. So you see they have flat crops, tall crops, flat crops. So what happens that blocks the, the dirt and the erosion to move from one side to the other and it just kind of stays in a controlled environment. Now, what is mass movement? The mass movement is a transfer of rock and soil down a slope due to gravity. So look here. Eventually, it just collapsed and gravity just pulled it down because it's heavy, right? So like this is like avalanches and stuff. It kind of pulls it down because of the gravity. So triggers of mass movement, we have triggers. So one of our biggest triggers is going to be water, heavy rain. So this is when flood or avalanches, right? Because it's so heavy, gravity pulls it where it needs to be. Um, so a lot of pressure, like if somebody kept hitting something, it's going to eventually make something shake. So a big old heavy amount. Um, over steep and sl uh, slope. So the steeper the slope, the greater chance of movement. That's why a lot of times you see them build things, even with bridges and mountains and stuff, they have stuff that kind of stop the erosion because eventually it will just fall. Uh, removal of vegetation. Roots keep the soils intact. So removing plants causes erosion. So we don't want to remove plants. We always try to keep them there. So you never really want to see a ground like this because if you keep removing it, it's going to cause something to happen. If the ground may fall, it may not be able to till again. Earthquakes. Well, because aftershocks can cause rocks to move, right? So when an earthquake happens, the plates move and we all talked about it and it can cause a shift or a breaking so here are some classifications of mass movements here we have a rock fall this right here is rocks or rock fragments that fall freely through the air and look at how that slope is that can be dangerous avalanches is because the extreme movement of earth material or snow so when it's so much movement and so much weight, it's going to fall. Gravity, of course, how heavier you are, the harder you fall, right? Slides. So again, if you're if you have a house over here, this is especially over in like Japan, um, in the Philippines, they have hills, houses on the hills. Eventually, those houses are not going to be there because erosion is going to cause it to move. Um, so in a slide, the block of material moves suddenly along the flat inclined surface, just like a slide. If you're on a slide. Slides are not like this, right? Slides are like an angle. Why? Because when you sit on that top of the slide, you say, wee, and you go down. Well, that's what happens when there's a buildup. Eventually, it's going to say, wee, and go all the way down. Those are called rock slides. Then our last one is slumps. This is just when it moves like the Grand Canyon, and it just moves in a downward block around a curved surface. So it kind of goes like this. If you play Call of Duty, you will see that they have a lot of this there and a lot of terrain areas. So we also have flows. Flows are mass movements of material containing a lot amount of water. So as you see here, the mud, you see how the road broke off because of a lot of water. Um, we actually currently dealt with, uh, with Hurricane Matthew a few years ago where so much rain and stuff caused our roads to crack and we saw the roads fall in. One happened recently in Smithfield, where the little babies were carried away in the water. Mud flows move quickly and carry a mixture of soil, rock, and water. 
and has the consistency of wet concrete. So you know how thick wet concrete is and is that heavy. Earth flows move slowly and carry clay enrichment. So if it's an earth flow, it's going to move, but mud flows is kind of is kind of quickly, okay, and thick. Then we have a creep, which is a slow down here movement. So as you see, we have the, a lot of those. It's the slowest type of mass movement. And eventually, it'll go down. As you see here, you're going to have cracked roads. So a lot of times we start seeing roads is crack, cracked, and it has like a little hill or maybe like a little water thing or a creek here and we'd be going around those curves eventually that road is going to be lower because it is a creep 